morning to everyone. I'm delighted to participate in today's event as a member of the Federal Reserve's Industry Relations Team. Our agenda is shown on slide two. We'll begin with an overview of synthetic identity payments fraud. Then we'll hear from our expert panel about the issue of synthetic identity fraud and how it affects the U.S. payment system. Our panelists will have ample opportunities to answer your questions as well. Go ahead and submit your questions electronically at any point during this webinar. You'll also hear what's to come from the Federal Reserve as we seek to research, educate, and promote industry dialogue about synthetic identity payments fraud. Let me kick off our webinar with some introductions of our panelists who are shown on slide three. Our moderator, Jim Cunha, is Senior Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and one of the leaders of our payment security strategy. He also leads the Boston Fed's cash operation, wholesale payments, mobile and digital payments, two businesses for the U.S. Treasury, and our efforts in exploring digital currencies, distributed ledger, distributed ledger technology, and blockchain. So he's a busy guy. Ken Miser, our next panelist, is Chief Compliance Officer at ID Analytics and regularly writes and speaks about synthetic identity fraud. He also has provided expert testimony to state and federal regulators on best practices and identity risk management and the use of public records and private consumer data. Justin Davis is a certified fraud examiner and a fraud manager at Digital Federal Credit Union. Based on asset size, DCU is the largest credit union headquartered in New England and among the top 20 nationwide. Our fourth panelist, Kirk Stockton, is Senior Vice President of Enterprise Fraud Management and Controls at Bank of America, which, as you know, is the second largest bank in the U.S. He has held a variety of fraud roles over the past 13 or more years and now focuses on assessing new fraud risks and identifying mitigation tactics. We would like to thank Ken, Justin, and Kirk for sharing their expertise on our webinar today, and we thank all of you who took time out of your busy day to discuss payment security with us. Again, if you have questions during this webinar, please submit them electronically. We'll answer questions at several points within the webinar and at the end. So at this point, let's move to slide four and begin with an overview by Jim Cunha. Jim? Thanks, Mary Ellen. And let me uh, add my thanks to Mary Ellen to all of you. I heard there's over 450 people on this webinar, which is great. We consider that a success and also to our, our panelists. Uh, before we get into the slide, I just want to mention that uh, this effort really is part of a larger effort the Fed has to improve the payment system, all in, under the umbrella of what we call strategies for improving the payment system, or SIPs. And one of these is to help reduce fraud in payments and also to improve the resiliency of payment systems. So this particular track on synthetic identity is part of, of that work. So I'll take a few slides here just to get us on the same page of what we mean by synthetic identity and just some of the causes. So to see in this slide, uh, first of all, there are many different definitions of synthetic identity fraud. Uh, one because of just inconsistencies in terminology, but also there are different variations. But for now, we'll just uh, refer to it as the combination of a valid piece of information, usually a social security number, with either fictitious information, name, date of birth, et cetera, or uh, something that's been stolen or compromised uh, out uh, in the internet. And so basically, we create a fake persona around a valid social security number. And the goal here is to try to make that fake persona look like a real person with a good credit score. And we'll talk a bit about that during this uh, session. And the fraud can actually be perpetrated in many areas, payments fraud, which is the one we focus on as part of the Federal Reserve's efforts, but also health insurance, uh, government benefits, et cetera. So it's actually something that's very pervasive in a number of different areas. But we're focusing on uh, payments uh, system security specifically. Next slide. So who can be affected? And I think this is probably the most insidious part of this particular type of fraud. It really preys on the most vulnerable. So what the fraudsters do is usually go for somebody where that social security number is not being currently used, so children who won't use it until they get of a, a age for a credit card or, or a student loan, et cetera. The elderly who are less likely to use it, homeless, incarcerated, but also immigrants. So this is really um, looking at those that are the most vulnerable to this type of problem. And uh, we say that the fraud affects 
you know, the entire payment system and the cost because these, as we'll hear today, um, get into some big numbers. There's some um, really large numbers that are affecting uh, these types of, of credit losses here. If you go to slide six. So what contributes to it? There are many factors. We list a few here. Uh, one, as I mentioned, is there's a, a lot of compromised uh, information, PII, and other information out there that's being used to help validate uh, uh, identities. So the fact that so much is exposed out there creates you know, part of the challenge. Um, there's no immediate impact on the victims because they're not using them, but let's be very clear that eventually when that child grows up and tries to use a social security number, there's a real impact when you see a bad credit history. So some people say it's victimless, but really the victim just hasn't yet been identified and has not yet caused that pain. So another factor is the randomization of social security numbers. So in 2011, ironically, as part of a scheme to try to make the social security numbers less vulnerable to um, the theft, they were randomized. Prior to that, part of the social security number actually was linked to uh, where you were from and also another group number, which was a serial number that can actually be used to try to validate whether this person really comes from this particular area and when the SSN was issued. So the randomization created a problem that you just can't do that um, without additional information. Also, ineffective controls both in the account setup and in the actual transaction information. And we say ineffective because the synthetic identity is new. So the patterns of fraud didn't really exist, or at least not to this extent in the past. So as the fraudsters went to new areas and get more sophisticated, uh, the existing um, you know, controls that were in place just weren't strong enough. Also a shift to remote uh, ways of signing up for accounts. So obviously if you're walking into a financial institution to sign up for an account, you're less likely to be stealing someone's social security number and having the identity information with you. And also there are high payoffs, so obviously the bad guys are going to follow where the high payoffs are potentially uh, available. Next slide. So I get, hope that gives you a sense for just what synthetic identity is and how it's perpetrating. The fraud is growing and it's also moving into new areas, so just a very little bit about what we can do about it. As I mentioned, the Federal Reserve is looking at this, so the top of the slide here actually you read from the bottom up. So we're having an industry dialogue. We're reaching out to experts like we have on our phone today and others in the industry to understand, so what is the scope of synthetic identity fraud? What do we know about it? What kind of data exists? What are mitigation strategies? And maybe doing some of our own research. And our goal there then is to understand the problem and then share that broadly with the industry, you know, through education, through webinars like this, through blogs, through white papers. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So our goal in the first year here really is to understand the problem and educate the universe and then determine what steps we may want to take in 2020. And obviously by doing that, we're calling attention to the problem and getting more focus on it. Also within the industry, uh, there is a law passed that mandates that the Social Security Administration open up its database for inquiries and validation of the Social Security number with name and address, and some of our speakers will talk specifically to that. But that law was particularly put in place to deal with these authentic identities, which was passed this past year. So with that, I'm just going to turn it directly over to Ken for his comments and his perspectives on synthetic identity fraud, and then I'll have a question, and then we'll take a question from the audience before we move on from there. So Ken, let me pass it to you. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and again, thank you to the Federal Reserve for having us on. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ken Miser. I'm with a company in San Diego called ID Analytics, and for about the past 15 years or so, um, we've been developing uh, database-driven uh, algorithmic methods of attempting to detect identity fraud. Um, we run a consortium that has FIs and telecoms and fintechs and platform lenders, and so we get a really good cross-industry uh, set of data, about a million applications a day that come into us uh, with performance that follows so that we're able to do a lot of analysis and to build scores that are designed to uh, to figure out whether or not specific applications are risky. We started talking about synthetic identities back in 2005, and at the time, 
the behavior sets that we were seeing around those were kind of as Jim mentioned, um, you know, the use of a legitimate social security number with sort of obscured name and data, name and address data attached to it. And often in many cases it was, uh, it was a, a money laundering issue at that time or it was someone attempting to try to confuse the credit system about who they really were in order to avoid prior, excuse me, prior bad behavior. Um, starting in about 2011, we began to see a pretty large increase of uh, these synthetics for, and, and reports of synthetics from our clients. And we think there's a couple things that drove that. One is the SSN randomization that Jim talked about, and the second is we started to roll out EMV in 2013 or so, and uh, in preparation for or, or uh, shortly afterwards, we began to see that it was, you know, obviously much harder to clone a card and to um, to steal that way. So the the mechanisms to to be able to access these accounts, you either had to you either had to take over an account that already existed, or you needed to create one. Um, and this is really where synthetics came in. Um, the historical pattern has always been third-party fraudsters, and, uh, and and EMV and and randomization definitely began to change that, right? We like to say that synthetic fraudsters are the legitimate owners of these illegitimate identities. And so when you put normal mechanisms to stop these accounts in front of folks, um, they're able to answer the questions. They can pass authentication because they created these events. They've been very patient and used these, uh, used these identities over the long term to bust out. And I think that uh, Justin and Kirk will talk a little bit more about sort of from the bank side and the credit union side what they've been seeing on their side. But when we look at the life cycle of these, unlike third-party fraudsters, the synthetics have been very, very patient and they work very, very hard to establish multiple accounts with those synthetic identities. Um, and then we generally see a, a life cycle that, that indicates somewhat of a bust out. Um, Jim talked about the, uh, the the randomized SSN and the Section 215 uh, Social Security Act. We've been working um, along with a number of other industry organizations and, and folks like Bank of America also on this call have, have been in a couple of the consortiums that we're involved with talking to the SSA about, first of all, getting the legislation passed and then how this will be operationalized. One thing that we've been very, very concerned about in this is, is that the the SSA law is a, a very good law to the extent that it goes, but it only uh, today, as we interpret it and others have interpreted it, cover financial institutions. So uh, telecoms and fintechs and others that don't necessarily have charters, it is uncertain as to whether or not they will have uh, access to this. And they are large contributors to the credit population, and this is how these identities are created. The idea is to is to create something at the bureau. I think we went one slide too far forward. Um, so uh, a couple things that our uh, our data is showing right now that we think is kind of unusual is people have talked about the way that these get created is a, a mechanism called credit piggybacking, where I have a I want to create a synthetic identity and I want to create some history attached to it is I may pay someone um, or a fraudster may uh, bootleg somebody onto an already existing bad account to get some history attached to them. Uh, we thought that this was a majority behavior. It looks like it's less than 50%. Um, the other thing to Jim's point earlier on, ran, on SSNs and randomized SSNs is less than 40% of the SSNs that we're seeing in synthetics uh, based on about an eight and a half million uh, record study that we just completed, um, only about 40% of those are asserting a random social security number. The rest of those social security numbers are legitimately issued social security numbers, the majority of which appear to us to be issued uh, in recent years prior to randomization, which means that there's this whole latent set of compromised identities for children that when they hit 18 and begin to be active, uh, participants in the credit system, they're going to end up having an issue because um, in many ways the Bureau 
methodology today is first to claim is presumed to be the legitimate owner. It's one of the reasons why this verification of the SSN uh, to the SSA makes a lot of sense. Going back to authoritative sources matters a lot. And the other one was that was kind of surprised us from a myth standpoint was only about half the applications that we're seeing are coming through what we would call a faceless channel, an online application. The rest of them are in person, either at a retail or um, I think Kirk's going to talk a little bit about sort of uh, presence at the at the bank, and the and it, this goes to the sophistication of the of the fraudster. So um, you know, definitely an increased set of behaviors that we're seeing around this, and um, it looks to us like the keys to this are looking at uh, utilization and life stability, and um, and their presence in trade lines and really monitoring the accounts once they're created because it is very, very difficult to tell the difference between a legitimate new entrant to the system and someone who is piggybacking onto those methods. So Jim, I'll turn it back over to you for now. Okay, thanks Ken. Um, you mentioned the amount you've seen over the years. Um, so can you talk just uh, briefly a couple of things that uh, financial institutions should look in their portfolio for as far as what characteristics help identify what might be a synthetic ID, knowing that the challenges they look real. Uh, what, what, what few things come to mind as far as characteristics for our, our, our financial institutions? Yeah, I think um, certainly the assertion of a post-random SSN creates a fair amount of concern, right? I said only 40% of them out of post-random SSN, but um, based on traditional usage patterns at this point in time, that's about eight times what we should see, given a normal aging up population or the legitimate uh, issuance of SSNs to uh, to, to immigrants, uh, the, real, the real owner of an SSN, we should be seeing somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% and we're seeing 40% right now. Uh, certainly a bit of, a, of, a, uh, of an issue. Um, there are a lot of behavioral cues and, and we have a score that we have developed that helps to highlight some of this behavior um, and not to not to shill something of our own, but it really, you know, gets around to this question of stability, and um, there is some indication that the that the fraudsters are clustering names and ad or, or addresses and phone numbers and contact information to direct applications to places that they're going. Great, thanks. And Mary Ellen, do you have one from the audience before we move on to Justin's? I do. Um, the audience question is, um, aside from the question of who can access the Social Security database under Section 215, will the actual check that you can do of the name and Social Security number be effective in, in stopping this type of fraud? Uh, I think it's going to be a major step forward, right? The, the current uh, presumed methodology around this would follow the, uh, the consent-based verification system that exists today just without the requirement to obtain the wet signature. And so in that case, what you're going to present to the SSA is a name, social, date of birth combination, and the assumed response back will be uh, this matches or this doesn't match. And it will still be up to the institution to do additional due diligence if the match doesn't come up correct. Um, you know, there's name variations, maiden name, married name, those kinds of things like that that may still need to be resolved. But having at least a touchstone that allows uh, the check against an authoritative source makes a lot of sense to us. Great, thanks. All right. So, Justin, why don't you give us perspectives from a, a smaller finance institution and how they think about this? Of course. Uh, hi, and good morning, everyone. Um, First, I want to say uh, thank you to Federal Reserve for putting something like this together. I think it's very important um, and want to say thank you for, uh, for joining us today. I know most, most of you are, pr are pretty busy. Um, but uh, like you said, my name is Justin Davis. Um, I manage the fraud and BSA departments here at uh, DCU. But before I joined DCU, I actually worked for a major uh, credit card issuer, and it was there that I first had kind of started to learn about synthetic identity fraud 
and started to identify it. Um, this was around 2014, so I've had the opportunity uh, over the last about four, four and a half years of, of learning and studying and researching um, synthetic identities. And at first, it, it was very difficult to, to spot and identify. It's something brand new to the industry. Not many people have seen it. Or you have seen it, and you just haven't noticed that, you, uh, that it was synthetic. Uh, looking at a very high level, you know, these these identities, these people look very good. They're prime. They're exactly who we want to lend to. They're who we want to do business with. But it isn't until you start digging deeper into the data and start digging deeper into uh, their history, the credit report, and how uh, the identity came to be that you start to identify uh, the synthetic piece and if they truly exist or not. Um, you know, you'll, you'll notice that this person has a, a 750 to 780 score, and uh, when you actually look into it, it doesn't make sense on how that came to be. Um, now, I'm sure I could probably ask almost everyone on this webinar uh, how they define synthetic identity, and most of you would give me a different, a different definition. Uh, we, one thing I think the industry um, struggles with right now is, is putting a, a, a true definition on synthetic identity fraud. But for, for me and for kind of DCU, we've, we've defined it more so as uh, first party fraud, where the identity has been manufactured with the sole intent to defraud the financial institution. So historically, fraud, you know, with third party fraud, we have identity theft, you have check fraud, account takeover you're able to confirm fraud with someone, speak to someone, they tell you they did not make that transaction, they did not open that account. And you're able to confirm that fraud occurred. Whereas here, it's first party fraud where you, you, you're not able to really confirm with anyone that fraud occurred because in, in the case of synthetics, the identity doesn't actually exist. So fraudsters today and with synthetic identities specifically are getting very sophisticated. It's not like it used to be. They're very patient. They're willing to wait. You know, uh, how synthetic identities are typically created, and, and, and uh, Ken had, had touched on this, is they piecemeal the information together using SSNs that they gather. Uh, and and uh, one of my concerns, as both Jim and Ken mentioned, is that uh, they're targeting a lot of children. And so we, we're going to be seeing a generation here in the next about five, ten years that, that you know, go to college or, or, or start life, and they're hit with tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. What can we do about that? But these fraudsters are taking all this information, and they're creating these identities, um, and, and Ken had, had touched on it as well by kind of piggybacking off of legitimate users, legitimate consumers. Um, and what we'll typically see is they'll add themselves as authorized users, authorized buyers, or joint owners um, on legitimate people's uh, consumers' accounts and start to report that way. They'll start to obtain the historical, uh, the credit history from those accounts, and the credit bureaus will then see, oh, you know, uh, this person is on this account. They must exist. They, they must be real. Uh, and other, other kind of things or anomalies that we've noticed on these reports uh, is that they typically have, you know, they're reporting to numerous addresses all at the same time. One that I've, I've uh, I caught on to and I thought was, was weird is I always see uh, Utah. I don't know why, uh, but Utah pops up a lot. Um, but these, these identities, it just doesn't make sense when you really dig into them. Uh, I know one example I, I noticed here as I've started to, to look through some of the, the synthetics uh, at DCU is one that popped out at me was uh, the person had a 789 score, but when looking at when they uh, their in-file date, when they actually started reporting, it was only a month prior to when we pulled credit for them. So how how do you only report for one month, but you have an almost perfect credit score? Just didn't make sense to me. Um, and other things that kind of stand, stood out, I know back uh, at, at my old uh, my prior life. Uh, Something I noticed that, that, that was kind of weird was sequential ordering of SSNs. Um, and I don't know how they would do this, but the first five digits matched, but the last four were sequential. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, six, one, two, three, seven, but they all followed the same pattern, opening the same accounts, doing the same thing, and just laying dormant. So they're very patient. These fraudsters are very patient. But it does have quite a big effect on 
not only just the financial industry, but definitely smaller institutions and credit unions, because we don't have the capital that you know the the, the big banks might have. Um, so when when these synthetic identities hit the credit unions, they hit fairly hard, um, and it's very hard for credit unions or smaller community banks to identify these because we are so used to doing it the same way. You know, that's the way it has always been done. We're not willing to, to change with the times and change with fraud and, and kind of adapt to where fraud is, is, is changing and, and adapt our strategy. Uh, you know, we, we t take a look at the score, take a look at and say this, we look at this person, this identity as from, at fa the face value, but we don't really dig into it. And, and I think that is where we are starting to fall short, and that is why we're getting hit so hard, is because we, we don't have the sophistication or the ability to really dig into the data uh, quickly and identify these anomalies that might be there. Um, and, it, and like I said, it does have a very big effect because they do hit hard. Uh, and the, the synthetics that I've been able to identify here at DCU, um, you know, they typically have a four to five times higher uh, loss that's, that's tied to them, their credit, their credit write-off to, to these identities compared to, to normal uh, fraud losses or credit write-offs is, is usually four to five times greater. You know, I'm seeing an average of around $35,000 per identity uh, when they are able to get in. Um, and so I think that's, that's where we are struggling right now is um, with the smaller institutions is, is we just, it's, it's not as easy to identify these. We don't have the resources really to be able to dig in and review um, and being able to adapt to a new emerging trend that not a lot of people know about. Um, but uh, Jim, I think there's a, a question you, you might have had for me. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Justin. You partially answered it, but that, that's what I expect. Um, I've, I've done a number of speeches where there were smaller uh, financial institutions in the room, and I, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised at sort of lack of awareness about synthetic identities, and you got to part of the problem, the sheer scope and the resources. Do you have any sense for just how big a problem it is? Obviously, any one is a big hit for a smaller institution. You mentioned, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, but any sense for just the scope of uh, how big this is in the, are they not seeing it, or is it only rarely, or is it more common than you think we, we know at this point? Yeah, I think it is a lot more common than, than we know. Um, I think with credit unions specifically, we're very engaged and in tune with our members. And so when it comes to fraud, we usually think of fraud as something that we have been able to confirm with the person we're doing business with or we've been able to speak to. They have been able to tell us and confirm to us that they did not do that. With this, though, there is no one, there, the identity does not exist, there's no one to actually speak to, and so it is a lot harder to identify and detect. Um, and with that, I believe, you know, first party fraud, it's, it's just much harder to detect so we don't label it as fraud. I think if institutions were able to dig into just their normal credit write-offs, their delinquencies, they would start to see uh, that synthetic is, a, is probably a lot more prevalent in their institution than they uh, believe. All right, thanks. So, Mariana, uh, Mariana do, excuse me, do we have a question for Justin from the audience? Uh, we, do have, we do have a question from the audience. Um, what are some suggestions to increase um, attention to this issue among smaller financial institutions? I think what we have the benefit uh, of being from smaller institutions is the ability to collaborate more often uh, and people are more willing to work together. Um, so I think that being able to, to speak to your peers, collaborate more, and, and especially what you guys are doing here with the Federal Reserve and, and putting on webinars, showing, trying to educate um, the leaders in financial institutions, the experts on fraud, um, I think that is going to be where the, the most uh, change occurs is once we can educate people on how to identify and how to detect, we'll be able to pick up on it quicker. So I think that's probably the major uh, piece that I would, I would um, recommend. As well as, as, like I had said prior, we're, we get stuck in our ways of always doing it the same way. Uh, we need to begin to adapt and not, not take a look at the loans and 
things that we underwrite at face value and really dig into the data to identify where there might be anomalies. Great. Thanks, Justin. Your, your points about you know, educating the uh, leaders of these institutions uh, makes a lot of sense. So far I've talked to four or five hundred, so 12,000 to go. Um, with that, let me turn it over to the other s side of the spectrum on the size of the financial institution and get uh, Kirk's perspective from the large bank side of things. Kirk? Thank you. And uh, again, as Justin said, thank you for everyone for having us and for coming and taking the time to listen. Um, I'll just give you kind of a quick insight into what I've been doing over the last few years, and then we'll kind of talk about our defines of synthetic and not the just the define of it, but how we treat it. Um, so over the last few years, I've been working to both identify, highlight characteristics, communicate with uh, other large banks on, on how we treat it and what we call it, and uh, trying to get everyone on board from that perspective. Uh, some of the things we've done is we've, we've broken out our first party fraud into kind of three categories. Uh, the f first one is being like true party fraud, where that's, I'm Kirk Stockton. I'm using all my PII information, and PII stands for, you know, your, your personal identifier information, so that's name, social, date of birth, address, things like that. And I'm going to plan on uh, uh, defrauding a bank. The other one is uh, manipulated identity, which is I'm Kirk Stockton, but as, as Ken was saying before, you know, maybe I've done some bad things with my credit, so I'm changing some things on my identity to try to create a new credit file. And then that third one is the one we're talking about today is, is synthetic. So we, we treat this as a completely fictitious person, but we put it under the first party fraud category because there is no true victim we can reach out to. We'll never get an affidavit back on these guys. Um, once they're gone, they're gone. And we treat those as a 90-day charge-off in first-party fraud. Um, so we worked, as I said, with the other large institutions, the other four large institutions, to make sure we're all treating them the same way. And we've worked on those defines and characteristics. Uh, one of the things we do to kind of attack this is you have to have pre- and post-book strategies in line. Obviously, if you can catch it sooner, as Justin was saying, we all probably see different losses for these. But these guys are exponentially larger in the losses that they, they take because they will, like we talked about before, they're always going to authenticate. They're always going to pass you know, the SNP test from a third-party perspective, and they always look good until they don't. Um, so we need pre- and post-book strategies. If something looks funny in the, in the beginning, make sure they don't get in the door, but kind of consistently monitoring them. So it's a combination of vendor solutions, internal strategies, um, and then obviously we're looking from a relationship level uh, of risk and then also a network level of risk. So sometimes when we find a few synthetics, we will send them over to our data scientists, and they will take two or three of these and turn them into 200 and find that whole network, and we'll start just closing those down in that perspective. Um, so uh, that's pretty much uh, where we're going with Bank of America. Uh, Jim, I'll, I'll throw it over to you for the question so I can kind of talk about you know, what we're talking from. Uh, sure. So um, thanks. Uh, interesting to get the perspective when you've got a, a large base and can ferret out hundreds based on one lead versus uh, the challenge of, of a smaller institution. So but, uh, all, all challenges. Uh, so really, uh, since so much of this happens in the enrollment phase, can you talk a little bit about uh, what some of the challenges are there in enrollment that make this hard? I mentioned a few, but I'm sure you as B of A has a, have a whole uh, set of experience on the enrollment side of this and what makes synthetics hard, or on the flip side is what makes it easier for the bad guys to get past that first gate. Yeah, sure. So obviously a big company, we're taking a lot of applications every month. So trying to find that needle in a haystack is the challenge here. Um, one of the things we see too is just, you know, the, the the challenge is these guys have gotten better at looking good faster, right? So where a synthetic identity a few years ago looked like it took maybe five to six years to really develop, now these guys are looking good in a matter of months. And we call those those pollinators. Those are those guys where they're adding AU trades and that's a major, obviously, tip-off when we see an AU trade starting a credit file that doesn't look right from a demographics perspective. And then we see these credit repair companies, uh, whether their intent is good or not, uh, they're creating identities for, for people, and we'll see smaller rings there, too. So very much a, a kind of a, becoming a specialized industry where different people are doing different parts of the uh, fraud. You know, one guy's helping set up the identity, and one person's actually submitting the identity and, and, and busting it out, if you will. So obviously, we've also seen 
these guys have no fear in, in some of these rings of going into branches to open up accounts. Uh, some of them as high as 40 percent, and I, I think Ken kind of alluded to that a little bit. So uh, w when we see that, it's obviously very difficult to to catch these guys, right? They're they're in branch. They're showing documentation, and even when we challenge them with friction of a document, so show us your uh, pay stubs or whatever it might be, they can get those and create those online now. So they can bring stuff in that looks very legitimate. Um, so they can pass a lot of that sniff test. So it kind of comes back to, in our feeling, getting that consortium data um, from either vendors, getting the SSA involved to understand if the social security number is good or bad, and combining that PII uh, the, of, the, of the identity along with the digital footprint of the identity. Something that you know some vendors can create, and uh, if you don't have a consortium of it, it's a smaller view, like we can see it in-house here at Bank of America when we're doing our link analysis. But at the same time, um, if we had more involvement into it, obviously it'd be bigger and more, more breadth, and we'd see things that we wouldn't normally, linkages we wouldn't normally see. So I think our biggest thing here, our biggest challenge with Bank of America, like everyone else, even though we're a, a larger institution, is getting that, you know, uh, defined, narrowed down, and those characteristics narrowed down across the industry and getting everyone to report these. Because right now, people don't necessarily even report them. Maybe they report them as a charge-off. Maybe they report them as a fraud loss. Maybe they report them as a credit loss, uh, first-party fraud credit loss, I should say. And, and just getting everyone to report consistently and have the kind of same characteristics when they're, when they're shutting these things down so that we can all kind of share in that data and, and attack these guys uh, together. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mary Ellen. Actually, could let me just uh, quickly summarize. I think you know that really paints a picture. Before I turn it to the audience questions, you know, I hope you know those that are here in the webinar to see just, just can grasp the the scope of this. You know, we've got you know synthetic identities that are tied to real things. We've got, as Kirk and uh, Ken talked about, some of the shifts in the tactics, such that as soon as you start to hone in on one. You get people who are making fraudulent documents that you have them in person, and they're still able to come off as synthetic. And then Justin talked about the uh, challenges of a smaller financial institution trying to learn from all this. And I think you all mentioned data consortium sharing, so I think that just sounds like a great uh, learning from all this. Is you know the safety and the value of all this data aggregated is is what helps us all. So I appreciate those comments. So. Mary Ellen, let me just turn it over to you to start to roll through some of the audience questions. And if we run out, I've got a few of my own. I don't think we're going to run out. They're coming in fast and furious at the moment. Um, one question from the audience, why do we focus on the lending process as opposed to the point of entry, uh, the new account opening online? And I think any, uh, audience, any panelists can answer that. Hey, Mary Ellen, this is Justin. I can, I can uh, touch on that if you'd like. Um, so on on my slide there, uh, it mentioned a, a company we're actually working with called Coalesce, and we're working with them to create a user-defined machine learning uh, algorithm that will capture these identities by um, identifying those anomalies that I had mentioned within the credit report, and that is where we would like to kind of attack it is not when they are in the institution, um, especially the credit unions, you have to be a member first, before they actually come in and try to open a loan, we would like to ultimately catch them at membership where we notice their, we pull their credit, we notice that the anomalies that we are typically taking a look at are present, uh, then we can go ahead and decline um, right there. Yeah, this is Ken, I, I'll add to this, I think that, um, you know, account opening is the place to, to catch these folks. Our focus has historically been sort of on credit accounts versus the opening of a, of a retail DDA account and, and those kinds of things. But I think that one thing that's sort of driving a lot of the, these behaviors, and, and, and the fraudsters are particularly sophisticated at sort of understanding what the rules are and how to get around the rules. And, um, you know, current FFIEC guidelines on how to do KYC CIP to validate the owner of the account talks about this concept of documentary and non-documentary methods. And, and Kirk sort of has mentioned the idea that, that in many cases these fraudsters are sophisticated enough to show up with, with 
if not real, at least seemingly real identity documents um, that matter. But also I think part of this is um, in the majority of account opening, the, the, the major process is, is this concept of non-documentary methods. So you go to information repositories like us or to the bureaus and the current methodology assumes that the first to claim is the legitimate owner. And so if you've built this identity, they tend to sort of reinforce themselves. And this is why, as an example, an authorized user trade is so, so insidious because it creates a credit file for an individual that then becomes proof of existence in many cases. So when we talked about the SSA and the SSA verification, um, this is another one of these examples that I think we have to get away from uh, from consortia data. This is one of these places where consortium data we need to be more careful about. And I say that as the owner of a consortium, as a data consortium, and think about the use of, of these um, validated sources, things like the, uh, the SSA or maybe a role for the DMV. Uh, and, and B of A and, and uh, Symantec IDA are both part of an organization called Better Identity, which has called for some of these things, right? So, so um, it is the mechanism by which we, which we open these accounts and the mechanism by which information is verified that has become somewhat self-reinforcing and that the fraudsters have learned how to exploit. Uh, I have another audience question um, asking, how do you identify that this is a fraudulent account? Does it go delinquent and then is found during the collection effort? This is Kirk. I'll take it. So um, we, we have proactive strategies. We have strategies that look at uh, accumulation of debt. So there, it could be either or, right? Ultimately, we want to get it before it even becomes in the, it comes in the door. But if we can't get it when it comes in the door, we want to get it before it runs up a balance. So there's, there's a couple ways we can do it. We do have strategies that look at the behavior on an account, right, that might uh, tip us off that something's happening, something odd is happening. Uh, one of those things is proof of life, right? These guys don't always have proof of life. Um, but we do manually review all of the accounts we look at before we call them synthetic. So uh, they, if, it, if it hits a strategy for something suspicious, it will go over for manual review and then get looked at. And, and if it hits certain criteria, we will close it. Um, so yeah, the, the, we, we don't want them to get into charge off if we can. Uh, we know there's, there's synthetics in charge off, probably more than we would like. But at the same time, we want to catch it uh, earlier on. And we, we do do that to a certain degree, I would say. Um, I have another audience question. It says, typically, how long does the fraudster spend building the synthetic identity before actually using it to commit fraud? This is Justin. Uh, I can I can jump on this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in one of my examples, I had mentioned that we had seen a identity that had just started reporting a month prior and already had almost a perfect score. So I, th I think it can be, like I said, they, they can be patient, um, but I think it's more on uh, what credit they're able to piggyback on. Are they able to get on to trade lines that have a lot of history, are active, um, and they're able to build that profile more? Or can they lay dormant, like in my other example where there was the sequential SSNs, there was about 100 identities there all following the same pattern, all opening the same cards, but they weren't using them. They were just letting them sit there and building a profile. So I don't think there's, we can say, uh, a specific time frame, um, but it's usually what I've seen uh, within like one to three years. Yeah, this is Kirk. I'll, I'll say, like I said a little bit earlier, we're seeing them get better at building their credit history faster, building their scores. So to say, hey, what's the time frame? It all depends on that fraud ring's ROI. What's their return on investment? What do they want to get from an account? Do they want to get 50,000 or are they okay getting 10? And they might get 10 within six months of opening the identity. If they want to wait and also buy auto loans, uh, we've seen synthetics in the mortgage space, whatever it might be, 
if they want to build that up, it might take a few more years to, to go, go through that process. It used to be, I thought the average was around five years, but they've gotten so good at creating high credit scores quickly, I think it's around six months now. Now, they're going to hit a probably a subprime lender first, and then they're going to come into the more prime lenders to try to get the bigger lines. Um, so we'll see that. We'll see a $500 credit line. They don't want the $500 credit line. They want the $10,000 credit line. So they might wait a few more months. So I would say anywhere from a few months to a few years. It just depends on the, the identity and what they're trying to do. We've seen some rings that burn through them very quickly where they just want to open a bunch, get a, get you know a few thousand dollars from each one, and then walk away. It just depends what they want, what that, that fraud ring's uh, end goal is, and what they want to get back from an investment on their on their scheme, if you will. Can I add one more follow-up question? This is Jim, as the moderator prerogative. Um, so we have the, we, you know, we have the identity. We have a bust out. Just call it thirty or forty thousand dollars. Do they stop, or are they then repairing that and then trying to use that same identity multiple times? Uh, any general uh, rule of thumb on these? And you might have a better view on this, but I'll give you Bank of America's views. It depend, again, it depends on the ring, right? We've seen them try to repair. We've seen them go to the CFPB and try to get um, get uh, trades removed, right? We've seen them call us claiming fraud and stuff, trying to clean it up. Um, so it just depends on what their motive is. It might be more work for that than just to create a new identity that they have. So, you know, Jim, you, or Ken, you might have a, a little more kind of background to that, too. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of detail on that. I think uh, to piggyback on a couple things that you said earlier on sort of the timeline around these and the sophistication, one of the major entry points that we would see is, is retail card. Um, and again, to, to your point, Kirk, about, um, you know, you start with a $500 line of credit, right? If you're, if, if you're going completely organic and building this from scratch, not even an, an authorized user capability is um, the opening of a retail card and potentially the opening of multiple retail lines and then um, the branching out over a couple of years. And, and again, I think the, the minimum life cycle that we're seeing, the minimum average life cycle that we're seeing is at least 18 months, probably longer for those. Um, and one of our clients had indicated that one of their signals was um, if they were one of the originators of the card as a retail client, and in many cases, they might see transactions and small payment amounts uh, associated with those accounts, was when the account came back and looked for a line increase, that line increases were one of the times that they went and did a significant amount of due diligence on the credit status and what had happened and, and how the account history had been built because what they were seeing was that was very preparatory to the bust out. Um, and again, I think one of the statistics that we had talked about earlier was average loss on these synthetic accounts that we're seeing is 4x the um, normal account for a credit bad. Great, back you, Mary Ellen. All right, uh, next audience question. What reporting services or intermediaries are financial institutions using to report instances of identity theft? Is there a centralized body collecting this information? So this is Ken. I'll, I'll say that all of the bureaus uh, and we are paying attention to this. Obviously, I have a, a, an opinion about sort of who's best, um, but that's a little self-serving on my part. Um, but, but we do see now a lot of attention being, played in the, uh, being paid in the marketplace to this specific issue of synthetics. I think we're approaching this from a slightly different way than some of the Bureau uh, experiences are, but um, certainly the common sets of definitions that Kirk talked about earlier on has been a, a major challenge, and we're now getting, again, uh, you know, from a cross-industry uh, consortium of, of telcos and, and platform lenders and FIs a lot of feedback on what they're seeing on, on synthetics, and I think we're not the only ones in that context. But, there, but there's not really, it's Kirk again, I'm sorry, it's not really a synthetic reporting mechanism, right? There, that doesn't really exist. 
it, it's like, hey, this is first party fraud or hey, this is third party fraud identity theft. But there's no indicator that I know of on those bureaus, right, that says, hey, this one was closed for synthetic. Correct. I think we're getting, um, we have now added synthetic tagging to our reporting schema. Um, and, and really it's been a, a process to sort of identify what we think the behaviors are around that. We and the bureaus get indications of the write-off and whether the credit write-off is a, is a fraud write-off or a, or a, a never pay in, on the credit side. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's obviously a much better opportunity for folks to, to report, but back to your point, we're sort of at the walk stage where most organizations are still trying to figure out what happened. And, and to the points made by, by, um, by both Justin and Kirk is, in many cases, these are hidden in credit losses. They look like credit losses. Okay, moving on to the next audience question. Do you see any correlation between the likelihood of fraud and the type of debt, revolving, telco, auto, and so on? Um, from, a, from a credit union perspective, what we have seen is they typically stick to auto loans and credit cards. Uh, we'll see some personal, but what I have noticed is it's, it's usually a auto loan and a credit card paired together. I believe on average the identities that I've been able to locate are about 1.6 loans per identity, uh, so just around two loans, and they typically are credit cards and auto loans. Um, like Kirk had said, it is on the ROI as well for that ring on what they're wanting to get. To get that auto loan, it might be a little, they might be, need to be a little more patient and wait in order to, uh, to be able to have the credit available, but they are building those scores very quickly and from a small financial institution, credit union perspective, like I had said, we take a lot of things at face value because that's how it's always been done. And so when they have a good looking score, that's what we want to lend to. So what we typically see is credit cards and auto loans. Uh, moving on to the next audience question, uh, when will Section 215 be up and running uh, with the Social Security Administration. When will the electronic verification be um, a reality? So this is Ken. Um, we've been having a lot of conversations on this issue. We have been told by the SSA that they intend to, to brief Capitol Hill on this issue um, very, very soon, and that we should see a proposed set of rules in the Federal Register. Um, for how the system's going to work for comment and, and response. Um, the SSA has been working pretty diligently to get this thing done. Um, I, I think that, you know, as a federal agency, their speed and time um, constraints are different than we might see in, an, in other contexts. So um, I think the industry's been a little impatient, but the SSA has been working hard to get this thing figured out. Um, one of their big challenges is trying to figure out like how much, how, how much traffic are they gonna get on this system? Um, and, and how many inquiries will they see? And, and just getting that data so that they can appropriately size the systems is, has been a challenge. So to be clear, nothing is built yet. Um, so my guess is we likely will not see this in calendar year 2019. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe it would show up in fourth quarter, but I don't think that's realistic. Thank you. Uh, next audience question. Uh, given the reliance on social security numbers as an identifier, is synthetic identity fraud a payment unique, uh, problem unique to the United States? Or do you see this as a threat to international institutions as well? Uh, this is Ken again. Um, I, I actually wrote a paper on the use of SSNs as, as part of an academic program that I'm going through. And, and one of the things that was clear, and I think one of the reasons why the, the SSA doing what they're doing to, to verify is going to help is, in many other contexts, national ID numbers are not presumed to be secret. And, and that the verification and the association of a national ID number 
to a person is is considered to be you know public knowledge or public registry information. And so the ability for me to take someone else's social security number or national identity number and assert that it is mine or or assert a completely fictitious identity around it doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, I have do not have specific feedback on sort of the prevalence of synthetics in other environments, but I certainly know that one of the contributing factors to this has been the presumed secrecy and obfuscation around um, who's the legitimate owner of that registrant number. Thank you. Uh, next audience question, what is being done to educate consumers such as parents to place freezes on their children's social security numbers? This is Jim, it looks like a gap. Um, I should mention that this webinar is being recorded, and if we don't get to um, your question, we'll follow up via email. So that will be one we will follow up uh, via email. Um, another question came in, um, and this is probably our last question we have time for. Um, on average, how many accounts um, does each synthetic identity open? What's the total loss? Um, do they re reuse the synthetic identity? I think we talked about that earlier. You know, clearly this questioner is looking for an, a sense of the scope of the problem. So this is Justin. Like I uh, mentioned, we typically see just under two on average, so I'll say two um, accounts or loans opened per identity. I mean, they usually, at least for, for from DCU or from credit unions, they, they typically just stick to lending. I haven't really seen much from a uh, ACH or check, any deposit activity. It's usually bust out <clears throat> and then leave. Uh, so what we've been seeing is, is, is around two. It's Kirk. I, I, I'd say it's it's more. There are some accounts we see with just one, but there are several. I wouldn't say it's the majority of them that have multiple relationships with us, but it's usually multiple products, right? It's a credit card and an auto loan, or a credit card and a deposit relationship. And sometimes that deposit relationship is the vehicle just to remove the funds easier. And sometimes that deposit relationship is the vehicle to get into the bank, like they went in and applied for the deposit relationship. Uh, did a $500 ACH over to the deposit relationship, and then are using that to pay back the credit card to, to build up the credit profile. So it, it could be it could be either or, and, and that just the, the DDA was the easiest place to come into the bank. So then they got offered a credit card and knew they would probably get offered a credit card and, and tack that on on top of it. So um, we see multiple relationships. Uh, we do see accounts with one. Again, it all depends where the identity is. Is the identity getting ready to bust out and they want a big relationship and they already have a couple DDAs tied to it that they can extract funds from? Or is it <laughs> a situation where they're still kind of building that and we just happen to be the bank, one of the early on banks, a point of entry? Um, and then they're going to build up a little bit more. So usually it's multiple relationships, and we don't see a ton where they have multiple credit cards with us, but it's usually cross-product. All right, Kirk, thanks. You get the last word on that since we're at the top of the hour. Uh, let me also reiterate um, Mary Ellen's comment that we're recording this, so feel free to pass along to others that may want to see it, and the questions we didn't get to will roll into uh, future work. So Ken, Justin, Kirk, let me thank you. Obviously, you guys have a lot of knowledge in this area, and hopefully the audience found your comments insightful and uh, give us a better sense for where, we're, where we are with synthetic identity fraud, at least from the, the payment space. And thanks for the audience for signing in and connecting. I hope that you learned something. I'll turn to the last slide here on 12. Uh, if you're interested, if you go to fedpaymentsimprovement.org, you can get information on this and other areas. You can also sign up. Uh, as an, um, a part of the community, and then you can actually select payment identity management and you'll get specific information relative to this topic. So with that, let me just thank everybody, uh, especially our speakers, and the great questions we got from the audience. We basically didn't have to get to any of the things we had uh, stored as canned uh, because of the great interaction with the audience. So let me just uh, leave it there and uh, thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.